Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's introduction uh, to the Construction Contract Administration. Uh, this is part 8.5, I guess, uh, as we go through chapters of the um, the similar practice guide. Uh, so with that, I do want to hand it off to Jim to get started with today's session. Um, and we're not sure if Douglas, our other co-chair, may pop in at some point. But Doug, or sorry, uh, Jim, over to you. Thank you, Matthew. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Construction Contract Administration Practice Community. We are going through the uh, practice guide, the current edition, and doing so chapter by chapter. So we're covering the second portion of Chapter 8. And Matthew, let's go ahead and dump, jump in and get started. So uh, we'll take a look at the next slide. And uh, what we're talking about are modifications today. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So how we mod modify the contract documents uh, obviously is something that occurs uh, on almost every job. Uh, I've certainly never had one that didn't have some sort of a change, but I do have friends that have managed to get through jobs without changes. Uh, Doug likes to say uh, very interestingly that we are uh, the only profession that he knows of as an architect and as an attorney whose documents are created specifically for the expectation of failure, change, or modification. So it's pretty inevitable that things are going to uh, come up um, during the process of a job. And those changes to the contract documents require very specific process. Uh, whether or not that change will affect time or cost. It certainly is a modification to the documents, and we need to make the appropriate adjustments in those contract documents uh, as we progress through the project. EJ CDC documents and AIA documents specifically spell out how we do that. And so the most important thing is going back to your contract documents with your client and your specifications typically in division one uh, that explain the process of modifying the contract and sticking with that modification process precisely and exactly. So let's go to the next slide and um, we'll continue to talk about how we modify those documents. Matthew, there you go. So when, when might this be necessary? Uh, well, what our documents are, again, to quote Doug, it is not a set of directions on how to uh, erect a project, but it's something that is a general explanation and guideline of uh, our intended end result. So our documents need to reasonably infer what it is we intend. And when we find that's missing, then a modification may be necessary. Of course, there are times when we see things uh, that we didn't anticipate that are unforeseen. Perhaps our clients change their minds or over the course of a project, uh, regulations, uh, building codes may change. That happens from time to time. Uh, where the local authority having jurisdiction may have an interpretation that is different than ours. Be interested to hear if anybody in the audience has uh, had horror stories I'd like to share over that sort of a, a change in the contract documents. There may be products that are no longer available or have changed in the way that they are manufactured so that we need to take a look at some other different product. Or there may be an opportunity to save money that our client or we suggest to the project or the contractor suggests. So we may want to take benefit of that. There may be new information that's discovered. Uh, in North Carolina, we had a time with a product uh, called EFS, uh, the Exterior Insulation Finish System, and uh, it was failing in many kind of applications. And so uh, the local authorities uh, stopped uh, the ability for us to use that material. So projects that had it had to come up with an alternative. There may be a adjustments to the contract, uh, also the time, and there may be changes in cost, et cetera. So those are just some of the examples of where we may find modifications become necessary. 
Uh, Matthew, let's go ahead and see if there are any hands raised so far. I uh, know at this point the audience is still quiet. Okay. Well, uh, all parties are involved in this process of changing the, the contract documents, and all parties can also initiate those changes. Um, so they can occur at different times, uh, either in meetings as examples or uh, communications of how things, uh, you know, the owner may raise their hand and say, hey, we, we need to make a modification here to change things. They can come certainly from the contractor or through the contractor from material suppliers or subcontractors. And there are multiple ways to begin to formalize the process. So at the beginning, um, there, there may be a written request for a change where we ask uh, the contractor for a proposal request or we know that there's a change condition that, that uh, the architect or engineer requests uh, a change order from the contractor or perhaps the contractor requests from us a change order to their contract or there may be a request for a substitution and those can come from either side uh, uh, any of the parties as well. Um, sometimes there are minor changes that maybe don't affect the contract sum or the contract time and those two will need to be formally documented as a change to the contract, even though they are minor. Uh, those may come in the form of supplemental instructions that the architect or engineer issues, uh, or they may come as clarifications or uh, interpretations that we make in the life of the project. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So we'll talk about these uh, here, and, and please raise your hand or uh, ask questions or share with us as, as we move forward. That really makes these uh, conversations much more rich when you are involved. So uh, I'll talk, and Matthew will let me know that someone has raised their hand. Uh, a change directive is something that uh, is a document that we use. Uh, a construction change directive is something that's an AIA document. A work change directive is an EJCDC document as uh, two examples of forms that are out there for us to use. And they direct that a change be made that even though there's an understanding that there's a change in the contract sum or time, it may be that the parties have not agreed to the specifics and or that the specifics are not quantifiable at a given moment. And so uh, often there is issued a change directive where uh, the contractor is directed to go ahead with the modification, even though the formal documentation is not yet complete. And then that would be followed with a change order uh, that does then establish the specifics for some or for time. Now. This next line is, is particularly interesting to me, uh, and in the state of North Carolina, the contractor is not to perform a change of the work without following the change procedures in the contract documents. Uh, and, and there are exceptions to that if there's an emergency, if there's harm, personal harm or property harm that is uh, foreseen or might be inevitable, then the contractor certainly uh, will proceed with a change. But in our formal documents, uh, it says that the contractor can't make a change without uh, the written directive or an agreed upon change order. But I must confess to you that it happens without that being done all the time. It's not supposed to, but it happens all the time. And this is with state agencies who have produced the documents that say you can't do that. Now, does that make sense? Ah, it, it, it bothers me tremendously uh, when this is done. I don't think it's necessary. I think all of us uh, as practitioners, and I include myself, find it easy to say, yes, please go on, go ahead, we'll get the paperwork done. And we all have the best of intentions to do that. But often um, there are other reasons uh, as to why we say go ahead and get it done. 
And uh, it's uh, like my kids, sometimes you kick the can down the road a little bit and not have to deal with uh, the decision or the, the debate about an issue right now. We'll put it off as long as we can. So I'd be interested to hear uh, from others about your experience with that uh, as we go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, we actually had um, two questions that came in here for you, Jim. Uh, first okay. one, has the construction bulletin been replaced with proposal request? Uh, they don't see the term bulletin used very often in industry reference material anymore. Well, I think so, and, and I don't know what the basis of that change is. Um, but I, I agree, I don't see that term anymore either, and I, I I think that it, well, now this is just a guess, so I, I, I don't know. I don't know the basis of that formally, but I do know uh, as uh, architects supplementary instructions or other titles have become maybe uh, more formalized in their use uh, that maybe that bulletin uh, has fallen by the wayside. Uh, you know, we, we, we still, uh, call some of the drawings bulletin drawings uh, that go out to be attached to construction documents and perhaps it was something that was being confused with those as well. I, I just don't know. I'm sorry. If anybody does, please raise your hand. Let Matthew know and, and he can unmute you and let you share with us. Well, why we challenge the audience to help with some answers here, we did have another question that came in from Jack, who asks, uh, who determines the emergency nature of the change? Wow, uh, that's a great question. Uh, for those that are licensed uh, as engineers, architects, uh, certainly your licensure requirements uh, state that you will take action uh, in the light of any uh, harm that may come to the general public for health, safety, or welfare. So certainly it would be incumbent on those practitioners that saw an issue uh, may take immediate action. And I think also it often falls to the authority having jurisdiction if there is something that uh, they see uh, as the work progresses on the project that is of concern to them. So uh, I don't think that there's any requirement for it to be a particular party uh, as long as there is an issue that uh, appears to any of the professionals that are associated with the job. I include the general contractor in that their, uh, their project liability insurance or the owner's liability insurance for the property where construction is happening may also have that opportunity should they see something that um, is of concern to them. All right. Any others, Matthew? Those are the two questions that came in at the moment, so um, feel okay. free to continue forward. Okay. So uh, often there we have a, a situation on a project where we want to request that a change occur. Uh, and there are forms. This is an example of an AIA document that is used to suggest to the contractor, we would like for you to send us a proposal, or the owner may as well. This is something that, that uh, we found, and could you please give us the following. That needs to come with complete and accurate information, so the contractor has the ability to uh, put a number to that, and also to put an impact on the project schedule uh, to the schedule so that they can uh, provide that answer. So it's incumbent upon us in the design profession or on the design side of the, uh, the team to provide adequate information and uh, be as thorough and complete as possible so that that proposal can be accurate. Uh, Matthew, let's go to the next slide if there are no other questions. And so this, uh, of course, is an example of an AIA document that is the change order itself, which is uh, used to, and the only way to change formally 
the contract documents. So it's a set of written instructions that we give to the contractor, um, and it uh, dictates either addition, deletion, whatever revision it is that we are uh, considering at the time for the project, and it should include money as well as contract time. Typically, the designer issues it. Um, chain orders actually can be uh, created and issued by the contractor, uh, and, and that's not typical. Uh, we get requests from the contractor, but the architect or engineer is typically the one that turns us into the formal change order that changes the contract documents. So this document, uh, to be formalized, must be executed by the owner, and it must be executed by the architect or engineer. It needs to be executed by the contractor uh, to be formalized. Uh, sometimes we have the experience where that is uh, at debate uh, for the contractor to sign it, and so uh, it, it does not get signed. Um, and that then leads us to documents that are that we just talked about in the form of a change directive. Um, so this is this is a document that can um, become the center of contention on a project, um, and it also may be a document that simply covers previous communication. So there's a proposal request attached to it, and this is just the signature document with the summation of the impact. It can be a cover for the change directive uh, that formalizes what now has been debated and agreed upon, uh, or it can be some other cover for other items that have turned out to be a modification to the contract. So, Matthew, let's go ahead to the next slide. And while that slide pops up, we have a couple more questions that came in here. Uh, so from Eric, um, has Revit or and or essentially BIM affected liability towards AE due to the expectations of 100% accuracy um, due to the sales pitch of BIM itself? In my experience, yes. We, I, I love to call what we all do in this business it is design, it is construction, that is for sure. Uh, to me, I refer to all of this and all of us as expectation managers. Um, maybe that seems a little silly, but uh, yes, softwares have come out and programs have come out to lead, whether it's the contractor, the AE, or the owner, uh, to believe that why it's just simply a key punch and a swipe and you're done. And it's just that simple. So why does it, A, why does it cost me to do this? Uh, why, why are you asking for additional fee because I asked you to redesign something? Uh, why, why is this costing more time? Because uh, why, why can't you just hit click and you're done with it? And yes, I, I think that the expectation has become that these documents are free of uh, errors, omissions, uh, mistakes, uh, particularly as applications or softwares come out that are plan checks that go through the documents to look for uh, interferences and uh, such as that. So we all have a job to manage, I think, the expectations of our partners uh, and uh, to dip them in a little bit of a dose of reality that while these tools are there, they are just tools and they are driven by humans. And, um, you know, we still make mistakes. So, uh, but I believe you're right that that, that expectation of um, a lack of mistakes is certainly there and becoming more prevalent that expectation and we had an additional question that came in here from edward and he was wondering um 
How would we document a change made by the client's engineer when nearing the end of the project and pressure is on to just finish? Uh, the GC will not meet to discuss the change. Just do it and let's get it done mentality. Ooh, I love that. Um, and and so there we are again, trying to manage an expectation. And perhaps early in the job, uh, we try to formalize during pre-construction uh, how we're going to handle issues like that. The best of us do the best we can, and it still happens at the end. Uh, I use documents to... Um, try not to make the client angry, but to try to make my liability insurance carrier happy. And so when I'm in that situation to say, uh, Mrs. Owner, let me explain, this is a change. This is going to affect time and money. Uh, there's a formalized process that our agreement with one another says I must follow. Uh, that makes you safe, Mrs. Owner, and me safe, and here is what we should do. Uh, here's a document. Here's the process, and I understand that everyone wants to move ahead. That's fine. If you don't mind, Mrs. Owner, putting in writing that you want your engineer to have this done on your project and you're not going to hold me responsible for that until we go through the process and formalize this, then please go ahead. But this is sort of in that realm of your undertaking work, which you are allowed to do on your project. Um, I'm just suggesting to you that there is a very tried and true method of how we should go about this. And so in some form, uh, documenting a conversation and being sure that your owner understands you're not doing this just to be a control nut. You're doing this because you're following the contract uh, is how I've handled that in the past. And, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very fine line. Uh, you don't want to be insulting, but you also want to be uh, in compliance with your contract with your client. Any others, Matthew? Uh, that's at the moment. Okay. Well, uh, one of the items uh, you see here on the screen, uh, a wonderful tool and uh, something that I encourage uh, to be in your contract documents are forms with which to use uh, to uh, receive change order requests, how you like to see those in your office, so that you can review uh, a change order request in the kind of itemized format that you really prefer uh, is one of those documents that you can issue uh, in your specifications. People that have supplementary general conditions that include ways and forms and processes that they have an expectation of uh, within their organization, I think benefit everyone. Um, certainly you'll have contractors say, I've never been asked to do this before. Uh, this is not the way we do it. Uh, here's what our software produces, and that's what we're going to send you. Uh, can be met with, thank you very much. I totally understand. However, in our specifications, this is what we require. And, and we'll take a look at a slide later that uh, it makes it for good reason that you have certain ways that you like to receive your information. So uh, I encourage you to include documents that you like to see that, you're that you are comfortable in working with uh, as you particularly receive and process uh, change orders so that they are itemized and, and provide you all the information that you want to see. Um, let's take a look at the next slide, Matthew. and. Uh, We'll talk about one other uh, type of condition that comes up that uh, is unknown. It's a surprise. Uh, do we have any questions before we go through this? Yeah, there's one question that came in from Edward. He was just wondering, are emails between parties considered documentation? Well, 
That's a good question. I wish Doug was on here to answer it uh, more formally than I am capable of. Being an attorney, I, I think he could tell us uh, his experiences. I, I will say that in my experience in any kind of a project that has had issues that went through mediation, arbitration, litigation, uh, they certainly are produced and handed back to you as evidence uh, when... <laughs> When uh, when you're unhappy to see them reappear, it seems that they certainly are looked at as documentation. Um, and of course, the other side can say, well, I never saw that. Uh, it ended up in my spam and I never looked at it. Um, you know, I, I work with people who require uh, that you check off the box that you've read the email and uh, they use it as a tool for documentation. You know, I. I think a lot of that has to depend uh, in the early parts of a project on your relationship with your client and um, just a feeling of paying attention to your gut. You know, when it when it feels like maybe things aren't uh, moving along as well as they have in the past, that uh, you may have to start communicating in a different way uh, than just with emails. But I believe that they can be. Uh, formalized, uh, and, and I have seen that happen frequently. Um, any others, Matthew? Nope, that's it at the moment. Okay. Well, we, everybody works on jobs that has surprises and uh, things that we didn't anticipate um, occurring, either those that were unforeseen. Um, whether that be rock that you found or underground water that you found, uh, natural springs, um, utility lines that were not marked, that sort of thing. Uh, it, it happens all the time. And there may be other situations that uh, perhaps the owner has decided to do some work uh, that you weren't aware of or they undertook work or made a decision to change something that's going to interfere with uh, what the contractor had uh, laid out as a schedule. Um, or there may be things that changed that were uh, that were foreseen but were beyond anyone's control. Um, I've shared with this group before, I worked on a project uh, one time that had two hurricanes over the life of the job come directly through the job site. So certainly no one could anticipate that and it definitely affected both the cost and the schedule. So uh, our documents, again, are created with the anticipation of failure, mistakes, and issues. So we are lucky in our profession that we have a very formally, uh, very formalized process to overcome that uh, and uh, be able to put the project back on track. So. When these items happen, uh, then uh, as the architect or engineer, um, we are charged to be fair and impartial. And uh, it's our duty to sit down and come up with some equitable uh, revision to the contract uh, that uh, the three parties uh, agree to and are able to formalize. So uh, let's take a look at the next slide. So we're continuing now to talk about change order procedures and and how we um, how we like to see or what we should anticipate seeing. Uh, so we'll 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 see pricing changes uh, with uh, changes, particularly those based on unforeseen conditions, and we may also see time changes. Uh, so you know the the. The pricing changes are based on the fact that the contract is very specific about what it costs when the project started, and it's very specific on how those changes are priced. Uh, we've listed on uh, our uh, allowable overhead and profit, perhaps, and uh, we've documented uh, sales tax, uh, how that's handled, if it if it can be charged or not, those sorts of things. Um, of course, the contractor is. Uh, has a duty to be fair and legitimate in calculating costs and when they're passing along costs from 
subcontractors or material providers, uh, that they do so uh, with honor and that they are fair and uh, appropriate um, and that they're accurate, that they have gone back uh, through a proposal and have been sure that all the costs are correct uh, and that those costs are a one-time cost. Uh, when you work in the design, bid, build market or other markets where there is a fixed cost, then we're not talking about increase in price here uh, because of time. Uh, we're talking about increase in price because of a legitimate change condition on the project. So uh, these are not cost increases, uh, for example, asphalt, uh, which fluctuates with the price of oil, in which I'm very glad I do not have to price and uh, honor a fixed price on, uh, that, that's one of the items that, that doesn't change in cost. Uh, the contractor takes on the liability of a fixed fee there, uh, or a lump sum, excuse me, there, and um, what the price is is what it is. It, in reverse, should the price of gas go down and the price of asphalt go down, uh, the contractor isn't obligated to give a credit change order to the owner. Uh, that uh, is good fortune on their part. So th there, those are some uh, items about pricing the changes themselves. What about the time that is impacted? Uh, well, we typically say in our general conditions that time is of the essence on the job and we need to get it done as quickly and professionally as we can. There are either dates that are set as a substantial completion so that the owner can use it for its intended purpose, or there may be number of days uh, that the contractor has to complete the project. And so uh, that is based on information that we receive from our client early and included in the contract documents. Often the changes that we uh, undertake impact the contract time. And I, I guess I'll, I'll just share some opinion here. Most often, we as professionals, I hate to generalize and I apologize for that, but and my friends, uh, architects and engineers that I've worked with that I know personally are very similar to me. The time piece of a change is difficult to uh, undertake and agree to and document each time that a change condition occurs. And I think the reason we feel that way is we're looking at adding some doors, moving some windows, um, going deeper with the foundation. In these segments of time, when we are looking at that change, the project may be ahead of schedule. Uh, things may be going great. We've talked before as a group about momentum and how projects have a momentum. And maybe these changes don't negatively impact that existing momentum. Why then do we need to add time if we don't really need to add time? And often my contractor friends will say, you know, I don't know if I'm going to need time right now. It seems like things are going to go well. But I tell you what, I, I would like to just put a marker out there and say, hey, maybe I can come back and, and add some time. Well, it's all with good intention, and I think it's all very honorable in, in us trying to be fair and impartial. But that can get you into trouble. Um, often that kind of conversation is happening when the honeymoon is on and everybody's happy and smiling, and when the discussion falls apart over that time, is when the divorce is on and everybody's unhappy with each other and we're not in the same frame of mind. So I don't want to be negative. I don't want to uh, slow down the momentum of the project, but at the same time, uh, it, it, it can turn into a real mess, a real quagmire, if you will. So, you know, there... I think it is beneficial to everyone to say, 
and and let me go back to that word expectation and expectation management. We would do well to educate our clients that changes in the project can mean time. And and I say this and you're going to laugh, just because we add the time doesn't mean the contractor is going to take it. And everybody laughed. But it's true. Um, I have worked on projects where we added the time as we came to the issue, or we said, we're not going to add the time. Um, and we made that decision early. And just because we did add days, uh, the contractor was still able to finish on the original contract completion date. So I, I, I implore you to give this some real careful consideration in making those modifications of time as the changes occur. Um, weather is another issue that is in the mix. And uh, the, the contracts that I'm familiar with establish a or, or require the contractor to include a number of weather days that are in the project um, that are weather days that they cannot work. And if they go beyond that and they're able to document uh, by comparison of the last five years of weather cycle, uh, that those are odd, then they're able to uh, receive those days. So sometimes there's a weather delay that doesn't affect cost, and you're able to uh, include those uh, at the same time that you make other adjustments. So I went way long there. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Matthew, we can go to the next slide, uh, and let's see if there are any questions. No questions at the moment. Okay, great. So uh, I put this in as an example going back to uh, support a little bit uh, the statement about including forms and the way you like to see forms uh, in your supplementary or project general conditions. So showing the contractor this is the way that I'm requesting that you provide me your numbers, and in this order, uh, can have a significant impact uh, just on the way that the tally happens for the final uh, total in a change order. So in example A, they're buying steel. They apply to it. They're allowed overhead and profit and have an additional cost and then deduct the um, the original steel package, and they come up with one total on a change order. Rather than taking that additional steel and first deducting what they had as an original steel package, which then gave you a total additional cost, and it is to an ad additional cost that you are allowed to add your overhead and profit. So your form makes this very understandable that before you add your overhead and profit, we get to a total new add. You don't add your overhead and profit to a single addition of a single material. And I hope that makes sense to you as the way it's uh, uh, shown here on the slide. So requesting a particular order of information can be very significant to your client. So uh, let's go to the next slide, Matthew, and see if there are any questions. Or maybe there's questions about this. We need to leave it up. No? OK. So. Uh, Again, I uh, continue to harp on this issue of documentation, but once, once the modifications are figured out, the changes are made, and everything's agreed to, are you finished with the change order? Well, no, you're not. And one of the most important parts is to now be sure it's posted everywhere. Uh, so. Where is that most important? Well, out in the field. 
how many times have you visited a job site to find maybe documents that were from two or three generations ago that are in the superintendent's trailer and that they're using on the job and that they may share with you, well, you know what, uh, the office hasn't sent me that. So it's really important when we go to the job, uh, and I'll tell you that my personal uh, process here is when I go to look at pay applications, which is typically once a month, then a part of what I review are the record documents, the as-built drawings that are being kept in the field. I know what my office has processed in change orders. I better see them attached and posted in the field. Uh, those changes are important, and the only way that I can assure that they're going to end up in place is if they're posted on those drawings that the superintendent is using. So, yes, it's fine to be in a file cabinet as a legal document, but let's get the drawings that were associated with it out here and pay it posted on your drawings that you're using. Um, so everyone is using the newest information. In addition, and also equally as important, is that the authority having jurisdiction is seeing that we made these changes. So what they are measuring against us meeting code uh, or some new regulation uh, for compliance that they see that we have made those changes and that they're using the most current documents uh, with which to sign off and be sure that we are in compliance. So besides jumping forward uh, into the next project and uh, when the owner might need the most accurate as-built documents, uh, that they are using to do the next project uh, first, it is most important to get those changes uh, noted and updated on the documents in the field. Especially, again, especially if it involved any kind of a code compliance issue. So Matthew, let's go to the next slide and uh, see if there are any questions now. Nope, everybody's quiet at the moment. Okay, so uh, we've talked about modifications. Uh, I've talked too long about modifications, haven't I, Matthew? Um, and we'll, I will uh, try to move quickly through substitutions here, um, which are very different. So uh, our documents, uh, whether it's in instructions, in instructions to bidders, like with the AIA document A701, talk about what substitutions are uh, and when they can be made. Uh, some are allowed, some are not. Uh, the perspective of these substitutions uh, and how what expectations are, how they're managed uh, is typically again in Division I in the general conditions. And there are forms, again, that can be used. Uh, if you look in the practice guide, you can see those. And I think on the next slide we have an example of that form uh, or one of them. Let's take a look, Matthew. I'm not sure if that's one I took out or not. Yeah. So here are substitution request forms, uh, the, and I highly recommend that you use those in your supplementary general conditions as a part of the project. Uh, just as with change orders and how you want numbers to be formalized, uh, these two can help you to uh, compare and actually um, formulate a decision about a substitution request um, so that you are comparing apples and apples. And I won't go through the form and what it lists, uh, and obviously you can't really read these in detail, but in the practice guide, you certainly can. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of things that you're looking at. So, um, you know, when, when should you think about these uh, as substitutions? Well, first, it's important that those procedures be established on how you compare items, um, and, and those forms help you do that. They are ticklers, reminders of 
pieces and components that you should uh, compare, uh, whether it's suppliers uh, or whether it's the product itself, uh, perhaps ways that it is um, uh, constructed or materials that are used to construct it. Um, it's important to enforce what your specifications require and uh, a substitution request is not something that is okay to be used for the contractor to adjust their costs. Uh, it needs to be an equal apples to apples uh, process that is fair uh, and full of integrity and honesty. So you may consider them uh, if there has been an RFI uh, on a project that leads you to some better solution. Um, if perhaps in the uh, in the process of the project, the owner changes their mind, or there is a product again that has become available that no one knew about. But you know, when when you don't use substitutions when you're not considering them is when it is a request that's solely based oh well I have a question and this is is the answer to it I'm going to substitute something no you, you may have found a need through an RFI but it's not the answer to an RFI if that makes sense a substitution is not the same thing as an answer to an RFI you may discover it in an RFI process, but answering RFI from the contractor is not them submitting you a substitution request, um, and they don't they don't mark up the shop drawing and request it that way. Uh, they don't uh, send it to you from a sub and not review it themselves as the general contractor. Uh, it is not something that all of a sudden changes the contract price or the contract time. Um, and you certainly don't consider it if there's not a detailed side-by-side -side comparison. And that's what those forms help you do. That's what those forms help the general contractor do before they would forward this request to you. So let's take a look at the next slide, Matthew, and see if uh, there are any questions so far. Yeah, there's actually one question coming in here from Eric. He's a mechanical engineer, and he was wondering essentially how often um, do you and the other attendees in the call receive these kinds of substitution requests? As uh, in his 18 years of experience, that predominantly um, takes place on his part of view um, within the submittal review process, and not in other times within the project. Well, I, anyone that wants to raise their hand and answer that, please do. I'll jump in and say they happen all the time in the submittal review process, no question about it. And most of the time, they aren't filled out on the request form. They come in as a submittal. It's not a submittal that was uh, specified. It's certainly not the, su the, the product that the specification was written around. And it isn't even one of the products that was listed in the in the X number of products that I'm familiar with and I included in the specification. They come in out of the blue, left field, totally new, often a product I've never seen or heard of before. And uh, as I do the research, often they are something that that contractor is uh, discounted to purchase. Uh, and that particular contractor believes is an equal, and most often that contractor has not done a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, so I, I agree with you uh, that that's where I see them most often. And we go back to pre-construction and to general conditions and to supplementary general conditions, and we've been real clear we're not going to do this. And we're not going to get into substitution requests like this. Uh, and our practice is to send them right back and say request denied. Uh, if you aren't willing to Mr. or Mr. Contractor take the time to do a side by side comparison and send this to me, first of all, in North Carolina, you have to do it before the bid. Again, as a reminder, these 
these conversations are based on design, bid, build. So in North Carolina, you have to do that before the bid. Typically, it's a date set a week before the bid. And if I accept it, I have to then notify all the other bidders that that is a new acceptable alternative to what I specified. So the state helps us a little bit uh, in processing those requests. All right, we had two additional questions. Well, I guess a comment and then a question came in uh, from Dean. He indicated that he's found it, um, found it particularly helpful in the process for comparison uh, to have the, uh, the four Cs, the clear, concise, correct, and complete process for substitutions um, clearly identified. Um, so just a, a harken back to uh, CSI's uh, recommendation of the four Cs there. Uh, but we had a question from Edward. Maybe we can help him on. Um, he indicates that this happened to him today, so it's very fresh in his mind. Um, is a release of liability form sufficient to protect a subcontractor instructed by the project engineer to install substitution parts not related to the manufacturer for the application? Ooh, really good question. I, this is what I'd love to do. I'd love to get him to send that in an email to Doug and I, because Doug is really the guy that should respond to that question. And and I know he will. He might not be able to get to it today, but uh, he will respond to it. And so, Matthew, if you could help, if you could send an email back through um, and and get that to us, that would be great. Will do. Cool. Well, let's go uh, to the next slide. Um, Matthew, I got to apologize. I've lost my count here, so I don't know how many we have left. Um, and we're getting close on time, but we'll go as far as we can. Um, this is the, the second to last one is on the screen now, but I don't think we've gone through this Great. yet. Yep. Yeah. So, how how here is uh, just some a few pointers of how we should evaluate these substitutions. So again, we've got the CSI form, which is just an incredible platform uh, to uh, prompt you, prompt us to do these things. Um, First and foremost is, does it meet the contract requirements? What you've set out in your specifications, um, is it really an equal? Um, you know, is, is the life cycle cost of the material and the product itself uh, comparable in, in with the product that you have specified? Are the characteristics the same? Um, is the manufacturer solid? You know, have they been building this and are they technically capable and able to uh, comply? Is their track record good? Have you heard of them before? Have they been around? Is this a brand new thing? You know, there's there's certainly there are products that are coming out uh, all the time and so many of them are very, very good. So we have to be careful uh, to be fair. Uh, and give uh, consideration to things as times change, but you also have to know that the manufacturer is solid. And so too is the contractor or the installer. Is this a product that they're familiar with? Did they just go to installation school and now they're an authorized applier of some particular product or they really have a track record as an installer and do they know how they're handling it and what they're doing? Um, what do the product representatives say? And, you know, I, my experience, I'll just share quickly. Uh, often there are salespeople that call on you, but they are not the technical people. Uh, and reaching out to the manufacturer, to the engineers and the technical engineers that understand the product uh, have always been very helpful to me um, in comparing it to other products. And so is the life cycle comparable to the product that we have included in the warranty? Um, 
all of this is easy to look at, but just don't forget that the burden of proving all this rests with the contractor, the party that requested the substitution. So my most successful reviews have been when that form is filled out beyond just the two pages and the contractor has submitted backup and additional information. So be sure that you require the contractor to prove the validity of the product that they are suggesting. Um, let's go to the next slide. And so this is uh, in review and what we've touched on here about uh, substitutions and modifications. Uh, be sure that you go through a very detailed and complete review when you're considering any of these. When there's a contract change, um, review it in great detail and include the time, you know, and put the time into it that it dictates. So if it's a curtain wall system, that's really important. If it's a pull out towel dispenser, that's a whole different review. And so be consistent with the important parts of your project, realizing that and putting the relevant time uh, into what you do as a review, both in modifications or changes. Don't forget that saying no is fine. No is a good answer and it is an acceptable one. So when you get information that's not complete, when you have something you're not comfortable with, tell them no immediately so that you can move on because the burden of documenting or proving is on the submitter. But remember and don't forget that once you accept something and it's on you, you've made that change and you've documented it. So don't be, um, quick to change and don't be uh, ch don't change without doing the thorough investigation, whether it's a change order or a substitution. And just remember always to follow your contract documents. You set the rules and I can't tell you the number of times I've seen my good friends paint themselves into a corner because they didn't follow their own rule book. So when you set forth information guidelines and requirements follow them yourself when you're doing your reviews so i think that was the last slide uh, for today's session and um if we have any questions uh i'd be glad to try to answer them uh no other questions so um jim you already have an email in your inbox uh with the question from edward uh, as well to douglas so f feel free to check that out and answer that following today's session um but this is the cool. last slide uh, and we do look forward to you uh joining us next month again as we start chapter nine um of our review in the contract administration practice guide uh so jim any last minute uh things you'd like to say here um or everybody we can uh disconnect and move on with our day no thanks so much everybody for joining and for the questions and i look forward to next month take care